Once again, I'm proud to have uh, our speaker tonight, Mr. Perry Short from Memphis. Uh, he's been in the SCV for 29 years, joined at Fox Crossroad in June of 1985. Retired from FedEx after 27 years, last 16 in sales. Nine years to write the book Generation of Warriors, which is a real good book about Chickamauga. Uh, he, he only has eight copies tonight, but he can give you his card. You can get them on a website or, or however. It's a great book. Been a Confederate Red actor since November of 1985. Started at Morton's Battery, which we all know about it. Then to the 19th Alabama Infantry. Finally, the 51st Tennessee Infantry. His great grandfather served the Confederacy in Key's Battery of Patrick Clayton's Division. He has more than eight SCV veterans that he knows of. His dad was in the Marine Corps, was bombed at Pearl Harbor, blown up by a grenade at Tinia, and shot at uh, Arizona. He's been married to uh, Michelle, his wife, for 32 years. So figured up, she said she was 14 when she <laughs> got married. They have two children, 28, 22. It's glad to have Perry Short back with us. <clears throat> and my wife's family uh, is from Winona, Mississippi. I know everybody from yeah. to Winona. And when I was dating Michelle in 1982, uh, we went down to see Grandma Ruby, Grandma Ruby King. Grandma Ruby ran the Winona restaurant, the main restaurant in Winona. So we go down there, and I'm dating Michelle. It's 1982, and we're sitting in the restaurant. We take her, and this was her place for a long time, probably through the 60s, early 70s. So she walks in there, and she looks around, and you can tell she's not exactly liking the way it looks these days. But anyway, she started dating. She was real happy. And she glanced over her shoulder real quick, and she got real quiet. And we said, Grandma Ruby, you all right? She goes, well, they're letting colored in here now. <laughs> <laughs> Grandma Ruby, it's 1982. But it didn't, it didn't register. So anyway, that's my wife's dad's family. And I want to say this uh, before I start. <clears throat> Mark 10.32 says in the Gospels, Christ says, if you confess me before men on this earth, I will confess you before the Father on your judgment day. So I'm here to tell you I believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. To be the Savior of my soul, and I have no excuse. I am a guilty sinner, and he is my Savior. End of the story, and I'll die with that. I'll die with that belief. Something else I'm not ashamed of is my Confederate ancestry. I have nine that I know of, as close as my great great grandfather, one great grandfather. My mother is a real granddaughter. My mother's 90 years old, still alive. She's in, she's in pretty bad shape, obviously, at 90, but her mind is still good. And that's the reason I couldn't be here in January. They almost amputated her leg. But we've saved her leg, we've kept her off the operating table, and she's doing better, and I appreciate your prayers for her. Uh, she's a retired nurse and has been a great mom. Uh, her great-granddaddy fought right here at Chickamauga. I had four ancestors on the field, three on my dad's side, one on her side. So that was kind of my interest in Chickamauga. There was no other major battle in the entire war where I had both sides of my family come together because my dad's side all was with the Army of Northern Virginia. So as you might know, at this particular battle, Gettysburg had already been complete. This was like two months after Gettysburg. General Longstreet talked to General Lee and said they desperately need help the Army of Tennessee. Will you cut me loose? And I'll go down and help. And General Lee did. General Lee went into a defensive mode around Richmond. And General Lee was a great defensive tactician, as you know. Longstreet got on the cars with his entire corps and traveled 990 miles down through south part of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. They couldn't come through Knoxville because Knoxville was occupied. So they went the long way around, 
cross at Augusta. I think the Swanee goes under Augusta. Crossed there, came back up to Atlanta, up to Ringo. And the first brigade off the train was fighting within a day. They barely got there in time, Longstreet's Corps. So that right there really spurred my interest in this battle. Uh, when I started researching the battle, I found about 17 families that were residing, trying to live on this, on this area, which became a battlefield. Chickamauga is a bigger battle park than Gettysburg. 5,600 acres. It's bigger than Gettysburg. <clears throat> it's the oldest national military park. It was the first one established prior to Shiloh, prior to Gettysburg. It's a significant battle. And my favorite part of this is it was a significant Confederate victory, <laughs> as, as you know, which we need. Uh, this is probably the most famous photograph. I don't know if you can see this. But this is Lee and Gordon's jail. This was taken right after the battle. Uh, Mike, if you'll cut that light, you might be able to see it a little bit better. But this is Lee and Gordon's wrist here. And Chickamauga Creek is in the background. You can see some water in the background. <coughs> they would channel the water under the mill, and the turbines would grind the corn, or whatever meal they would bring in between the stones and the farmers would get their meals, sell it, feed cattle, whatever they wanted to do. But it is on the south part of Chickamauga Creek that would be associated with the battle. Now, the, the National Park Service does not own that land, but their land stops about a mile and a quarter short of this. Everything is pretty much to the north. I give a tour every first Saturday of December of this park. Uh, people <coughs> buy my book and read my book, they want to see this part, where this happened, where that happened. I do that first Saturday in December, and you're welcome to come. There is absolutely no charge, uh, but I know it's a pretty good little drive over there. You might want to consider staying one night in the hotel in Fort Overford, but we have a great time. We had 16 on the tour last December, but you're more than welcome. <coughs> Michelle, go to the next slide. <coughs> This is a Brotherton site. Stop, stop. This is a Brotherton site. The main breakthrough, Chickamauga was actually a three-day battle. Most historians call it two, but you can't tell Walthall's brigade it was two because they got tore up on the first day, which was Friday, September 18th. Walthall's brigade, who pulled from this area, who's got a descendant here tonight, Walthall's brigade fought on Friday the 18th at Alexander Bridge. So it was actually a three-day battle. But the third day, this part right here is exactly where the Confederate breakthrough came. General Longstreet was in charge of that particular wing when that breakthrough happened. And it happened right over the Brotherton's cabin, and right over their land, uh, from uh, east to west. This battlefield is pretty much squared with the road right down the middle. And that road is Highway 27 today. It's called the Lafayette Road. It runs from the northern part of the park all the way to the south part, just dissects, dissects it. The Yankees used that road to their advantage, especially the first and second day of the battle. But just to the left of this fence, if you guys can see the fence, just to the left, left of that is Highway 27, running north-south. <coughs> go to that next map if you can. And I did a, a crude map. Let it go as far as it will go, Shell. Okay, that's good. This, this line right here, up and down, is Highway 27 to that, the Lafayette Road. The Brotherton cabin I just showed you is located right there. The family I primarily wrote about in my book are the Dyer family that lived right here. Spilsby Dyer was a, a lieutenant in the Confederate cavalry. He was picked out of the cavalry because he knew the area. General Bragg actually used him for a scout. That was what all the commanders would do both sides. They would find local guys and they would bring them into the tents talk to them about all the little deer trails, 
fjords, bridges, fields, they knew it all, so they would give the generals pretty good information. So he, he selected Spilsby Dyer, whose house is right here. Spilsby Dyer is 35 years old. His wife is 30 years old. Paulina Dyer, if you go to the next one. And this first one is his oldest son, obviously, as a, as a, as a man, James Monroe Dyer. He's the oldest of eight children. Uh, go one more, we'll see Mrs. Dyer. This is Paulina Dyer. This is Spilsby's wife, probably taken the day of his death. As you can see, she's dressed in black in mourning, like they used to do in the day. Paulina, at 30 years old, if you can imagine this, eight children, husband's gone to fight the war. She's pretty much there by herself with the exception of her father-in-law, who's a physician, Dr. Robert Dyer. But she is left with the farm, no husband, eight kids, the oldest is 12, and the youngest is a newborn. And she's there alone. The worst part of this is that the Yankees are converging upon her farm. Right in the middle of the battlefield is her farm. And the Yankees are converging on it. About 30, <coughs> come on, it's about 63,000 Yankees are on the way. And they'll come right beside her house. So can you imagine just the terror that she had by herself, basically, with her neighbors, but 63,000 Yankees coming through the year. Now, Confederates are pouring in, too. They don't know exactly where the fight's going to start, but it's going to be somewhere close. But just imagine the terror this lady felt in September of 1863. Uh, what happens to her children? What happens to her horses, her mules, her chickens, her cows? She knows they're all going to be gone because when the Yankees come to your farm, there's nothing left. They take it all. They'll take everything, and they don't care that you're not going to have. I mean, I've heard stories tonight of, of ancestors that were, were hung by the Yankees locally, by ancestors that were dug up out of their graves for the gold. You think this didn't happen, but it did. Now, it's not in your history book. Why is it not in your history book? Because the victors wrote the book. You have to really study and dig to find this information. But when you win the war, you get to write the books. Mm -hmm. And they leave that part out. That kind of spurs me on to write stuff like this. Uh, good one more, Michelle. As I get older, and I look at the political situation stuff right there, that we're in today, and what I see is socialism. I see socialism. I see the opposite of capitalism taking over our nation to where soon, there's going to be so many people on government assistance that the people that work and pay the taxes are going to be lower than the people on the system. That's when you're going to get really close to complete socialism, where the government will give you everything they think you need, but you're not going to have enough. There's never enough on their feeding trough. But lo and behold, way back in 1863, we had this guy right here, named Charles Dana, D-A-N-A, -A, Charles Dana. And I'll tell you who exposed this to me was Robert Kennedy, the guy that wrote the book, The South is Right, the Kennedy Brothers, down in Louisiana. They opened my eyes to this guy. This is Charles Dana, a committed socialist, if not communist, traveled in Europe, learned about the revolutions that were going on in Europe at the time comes over here and is hired by Horace Greeley for the New York Times. He works for the newspaper. After that, he goes and lives at a farm, which is a socialist working farm where they teach socialism. Go one more. The Brook Farm, just outside of the city of Boston, Massachusetts. The Brook Farm. You can Wikipedia and read about it. They taught socialism. They taught political control, where a small group of people control a large group of people. Being taught at the Brook Farm just outside of, guess where? Boston, Massachusetts. That fits. And this man learned very well 
and his political views, and all that's fine and good. But guess what this guy does between 1855 and 1860? He, he gets to know, I think it was Stanton, uh, Secretary of War Stanton, I think that's his name. No one more. And he gets to know him, and all of a sudden, he enlists in the Yankee Army. Here we have Charles Dana in the Yankee camp the devout socialist. And guess where Lincoln sticks him? Lincoln sticks him, or Stanton, Lincoln, then Stanton, Lincoln tells Stanton what to do, Stanton sticks him into the staff of General Rosecrans. General Rosecrans is the overall commander of the Yankee Army that has invaded Tennessee. So now General Rosecrans has a devout socialist on his staff. Even the Yankees didn't like him. The Yankees didn't even like him. They knew what he was about, and they knew he was there basically to spy on the Yankee staff. Lincoln wanted the war over, obviously, but he wanted it to be going strong in his favor when he was going to be hopefully reelected in the fall of 1864. He would have liked to have had the war over by then. We're in the summer of 1863. Charles Dana is on Rosecrans' staff. He is pushing Charles Dana to push Rosecrans. And Rosecrans is a military man. And he knows he's not ready to invade Georgia. Lincoln doesn't care. He wants the war over or he wants it in good shape for his re-election. He uses Charles Dana to telegraph him constantly telegraphing back and forth to Stanton at the War Department. Rosecrans knows what he's doing. And he knows that if he doesn't get going, Lincoln will replace him. So, Rosecrans divides his army in three corps, and he actually goes south of Chickamauga. Two corps completely go south, one to the north, and they are very well spread out. General Forrest has wrote many times if we would attack him now, we could have destroyed him one at a time. But there was some hesitation from General Bragg. General Bragg was kind of barred up at Lafayette, uh, Georgia, not really ready to move until his scouts started coming in from General Wheeler's staff, saying there's Yankees south of us, and it's a significant number. Bragg couldn't believe the Yankees were south, but they were. They had actually bypassed Chickamauga, were crossing Lookout Mountain to the south. Well, finally Bragg gets moving, and he starts going north to meet at least one corps. Then they start quickly gathering all the corps, and they just happen to fight where they fought, where these 17 families live, which is now known as the Battle of Chickamauga. It could have happened anywhere. They thought it would happen around Cleveland, Tennessee because they thought the majority of the army was coming down from Knoxville. But that didn't happen. The majority of that Yankee army went south. So they, they happened to meet at what, what is now Fort Overfort, Georgia. Most of you have probably been to Chickamauga. <clears throat> Charles Dana is on the staff with General Rosecrans. The first day of fighting, very bloody. Chickamauga is the, what they call the second bloodiest battle of the entire war. More casualties, uh, more people killed, more people wounded, more people missing, uh, captured than any other battle except Gettysburg. Gettysburg, of course, was three days. Uh, Charles Dana is on the staff. The second day, or third day, actually, of the battle, the major breakthrough that General Longstreet launched. And let me talk about this breakthrough for a second. <coughs> All of you know about the Grand Charge at Gettysburg. The Grand Charge, Pickett's Grand Charge, where they line up on a mile wide front and they cross a mile and a quarter of open ground. Open ground, not woods, open ground. So now they're subjected to artillery fire immediately when they step out of the woods. The artillery then changes to canister, which is very deadly especially when men are bunched in in ranks. And after that, they go to small arms, arms fire when the men get within 100 yards of the wall. General Longstreet, as you probably know, did not want to do that charge. He thought it would be fatal, and it was. 
General Longstreet is now in charge of the right wing of the Confederate Army. Excuse me, the left wing. He's not going to do what General Lee did. What General Longstreet's going to do is stack his brigades. He had eight brigades, and he stacked them like a stair step to where it was like a punch. And it would have punched through about any, any formidable object the Yankees could have put up there. It was a powerful, powerful uh, brigades and divisions. It wasn't over open field. It was in the woods. So the Yankees didn't even know how many they had until they came out of the woods at the Brotherton House. When they came out of the woods, eight stacked brigades, it just so happens that the Yankees made a fatal error. General Rosecrans is setting up on a knoll about a half a mile from the front line with Charles Dana and the rest of his staff. <coughs> General Rosecrans made the mistake of taking Yankee General Wood's division out of line because he thought there was a gap to the left. There was no gap to the left. He got bad reports. But he told General Wood to pull out of line and close up on Reynolds to the left. Woods had already been what they call in the military dressed down. General Rosecrans embarrassed him, a division commander in front of his staff, just three days prior. And so now Rosecrans is giving him a direct order that makes absolutely no sense to Wood or anybody else because they can hear noises in the woods, they can see pickets, and they assume there's a pretty substantial Confederate force in there. But General Woods gets the order and he walks to his three brigade commanders and he holds the order up like this. And he said, gentlemen, I hold in my hand the fatal order of the day and I would not part with it for a million dollars. And he sticks it back in his coat and he orders the brigade out of line. That was 11 o'clock on Sunday, September the 20th, 1863. At precisely 11.10, General Longstreet launches eight brigades at that exact spot where those guys were. There was no resistance. The brigades punched through and just routed the Yankee Army, just completely routed them. Charles Dana is asleep. He, he had got off his horse. The sun was out. And he was laying on the ground, pulled his hat down, and he said he went to sleep. But he said, I woke up to the most infernal noise that these ears have ever heard. What was that noise? Rebel yell. Rebel yell. It was the rebel yell from about 12 to 13,000 Confederates that were breaking through just 850 yards away from that spot. He jumps up. He looks at Rosecrans and he said, I saw Rosecrans crossing himself. He said, I knew we were in trouble. Rosecrans was a devout Catholic. Rosecrans jumps on his horse and tries to rally some men to his right, but he sees another 4,500 men charging in that direction. And Rosecrans pretty much knows he's either out of there or he's captured. They have hit right exactly where Rosecrans was. Rosecrans gets on his white steed and his staff rides. His white steed, nobody can keep up with. He was out of there, and the staff were trying to catch up with him. He didn't stop until he got to Chattanooga. He <laughs> left his army on the field. A commanding general. Let, can you imagine General Lee leaving his army on the field? Even Brad. Brad <coughs> General Rosecrans left his entire army on the field. General Thomas was still in place fighting, and various generals to the south, but that army was routed. This was a complete Confederate victory. When I'm writing this book, and it took me nine years to write this book, because I was coaching competitive softball, competitive baseball, working at FedEx, and if it wasn't for my wife, I would have never completed this book. Because I had the first part done, and I had the ending in my mind, but I couldn't tie them together. And I remember one day I walked in, and I said, I'm just give up. 
She goes, you get your butt back in there and finish that book. <laughs> so I did. But the reason I wrote this book was because I felt that this story needed to be told how complete of a Confederate victory we had <coughs> your ancestors. I bet you the majority of you had an ancestor at Chickamauga. I bet you you did. It was a colossal battle. But when I read about this, this battle, and I'm studying it, and I'm talking to the park ranger, the head historian, which I won't know, <coughs> I'm standing at the front desk, and I'm asking for information, and I make, I make the point that it was a complete Confederate victory. This is the response I get. Well, what makes you think it was a complete Confederate victory? I said, you know, usually when the commanding general is hightailing it off the field, leaving his army, and they're split in two and they're rabbits, so you might call that a complete <coughs> victory. Well, you can't just look at those two days. You have to look at the entire campaign. The Chattanooga campaign is what you have to look at. I said, this was two months before the Chattanooga campaign. And today, if you go over there to the National Park Service, they still write the books. They still name the films. They still give you the interpretation. And if you're not smart and see through it, you'll just go out of there thinking, well, I guess we got beat here too. No, sir, you didn't get beat there. But you know what the name of their film is? At Chickamauga, the name of their film is Chickamauga Chattanooga, the death nail of the <laughs> the death of the Confederacy? I mean, that's the kind of stuff we have in place today. When you go into Chickamauga, an entire wall around the corner is dedicated to slavery. You have to look real hard to find a little paragraph across the way that has a slouch hat, Confederate flag, if you walk up real close and read it, it says <coughs> some think that the South fought for states' rights and the Southerners lost their way in their identity. That's what it says. In Chickamauga, your tax money pays for it. You see, when you win the war, you get to write the books. Same thing in Gettysburg. If you've been to Gettysburg, if you've been to Gettysburg and seen the brand new Taj Mahal Park Service Center they've got, it's like going to Disney World. And you walk in there and they have little touch screens. You touch a state and it pops up. And the thing that it says is, the first thing it says is uh, percentage that owns slaves. You know what they say about Tennessee? And we probably had 16, 14% slave ownership. Tennessee, says 25%. In Mississippi, what do you have, 19 maybe? 18, 19? You know what it says at Gettysburg? 49.5% slaveholders. How far from the truth is that? 49.5%. That's outrageous. That's saying one of every two houses in Mississippi. I knew when I saw that, that they're just running with blatant lies, but they're educating the public on this. That's what it says at Gettysburg on your state when you get the little screen, 49.5%. Mm. So that's going on at Gettysburg. We have the giant wall at Chickamauga. Shiloh, who's, I think somebody in here worked at Shiloh, and the 51st Tennessee always goes to Shiloh. We always participate in the memorial service. We're in Confederate uniform. We went to the Yankee graveyard, Respect and honor that, all that for a little smidgen of a mention that we are also going to have a service at the Confederate Burial Trench. So, around 1991, 92, we've been doing it five or six years. We're standing there in line and we're waiting, you know, on the end of the service. And sure enough, he goes, We've had a grand time here today. We'll see you next year. And we look up and down the line in the ranks. And did he just forget to mention? Our Confederate service at the burial trench. And our commander leading over says, Ah, oh, no, I just forgot. He, he knows better. A year goes by. We're standing there again. Now I'm listening. He does it again. Thank you for coming, folks. We'll see you next week.
he forgot to mention it to the second year old. I said, Lee, what's going on? Well, I talked to him. He said he was going to mention it. I said, they're intentionally not mentioning it. They quit mentioning our service at the Confederate Barrel Trench at Shiloh. So I quit going. I quit going to their service. I went straight to our trench. And I do that. I'll be out there this morning, guys. And then you get these people that say, well, you're still fighting the war. You're still fighting the war, Sonny. You can't keep fighting the war. Who's really fighting the war still? Is it, is it them or is it us? We've got reason to fight the war because the truth hasn't been told. But they accuse us of fighting the war when they put out 49.5%. <clears throat> and they give you a paragraph and take them on. And they don't even give you the respect about your service at Shiloh. Who's still fighting the war? They're still fighting the war. It's my submission to you. Here we have the 1930 National Convention of the People of the U.S. and the USSR. I don't know if you can read that. The Friendship of the People of the U.S. and USSR. This is a communist rally. A communist rally. Look whose picture is above the podium. Abraham. Our ancestors fought the same thing we're fighting today. We're fighting for our small government. They're fighting for colossal government, now world government. We're still fighting the fight that our ancestors did. We're not fighting the flood, but we've got to fight it, folks. We have got to fight it with our recruitment. <coughs> we have got to recruit. Recruit, recruit. Talk to everybody you know. Bring them to these meetings. It's vital. You've got a great help. Probably one of the greatest camps in the Confederacy. And I brag on you guys in Memphis. Amen. I say you ought to go down to the Tip of Tigers if you want to see an on fire good camp. And I mean, this is one of the best camps in the Confederacy. But get bigger. Get so big that this place won't hold you. Get young guys in here. Get young ladies in here. We've got a mission. Everybody can speak and everybody knows somebody. So that's my, that's my point to you, is you can recruit, keep doing it. Turn this entire county into a Confederate county, a conservative county, a small government county. That's how our ancestors would have wanted it, and that's how our founders uh, initiated it. If I can help you with a book, you let me know. Thank you so much for your attention.